Judiciary Committee is called to order. Members take your seats. A quorum is present. Members, today we have six bills. House File 5, paid medical leave. Representative Halverson is already at the table. Nice job, Representative Halverson. 1503, tribal access to vital record data. 1138, digital fair repair. 804, data practices legislative commission. This is gonna be re-referred to Ways and Means. 1511, eviction case court files, discretionary and mandatory expungement. House file 2004, human rights providing unredacted information to parties in a closed case. And house file 2062, classifying data collected under the workforce certificate of compliance. That sounds like an exciting one. Um, but we're gonna be ready on all these. The first order of business is approval of the minutes for March 11th. Do I have a motion? So Representative yeah. Noor moves the motions of March, March 11th. Any discussion? All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed say no. Motion passes. The minutes of March 11th are adopted. Representative Halverson, House File 5. <coughs> you have an amendment labeled <laughs> A8. Is that right? That's Do correct, you have Mr. someone Kim. who you want to move that amendment to put the bill in the form you so desire? Representative Herr, I bet we'll do it. Yeah. Representative Herr moves the A8 amendment. Any discussion on this amendment? Chair Scott. Mr. Chair, thank you. Um, I'm wondering if the author could point out in this 13-page amendment um, that's not a delete all, but a line and word um, amendment, if she could point out the areas of this amendment that apply to our committee. Representative Halverson. Or um, thank you, Mr. Chair, and I'm going to ask um, uh, Mr. Weeks to um, address that question. Go ahead, Mr. Weeks. Point out the areas in the amendment that are gonna be up for consideration in this committee. Uh, Mr. Chair, members, the, the data, treatment of data within the bill, the House File 5 is in the first article and I do not believe anything in the amendment changes anything in that article. Yes, Mr. Chair, that's correct. So it doesn't affect the treatment of data under the new program created in House File 5. Okay. Mr. Chair? Uh, Chair Scott. Um, if, if House Research uh, that is at the table could point out the uh, page in line of the amendment. Hey, Chair Scott, can I ask that question again? Do you want House Research to point out a page in line of the amendment? Of the amendment that applies to this committee. Oh, that applied to the committee. Okay. Um, I don't know. <clears throat> Anyone uh, in the, research want to answer that? Um, sure, Scott. The, uh, the House researcher at the table. Sorry, Ben. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Go ahead, Mr. Weeks. Uh, Mr. Chair and Representative Scott, so I, I'm focusing specifically on data practices, which I understand is under the purview of this committee. There, there's nothing in the amendment that changes the treatment of data practices under House File 5 in the amendment. Okay. Well, this committee has data practices, judiciary, civil law, Pretty much everything, but I don't know. I, I, if you're focusing just on data practices and there's nothing in the amendment relating to data practices, is that answer adequate for you, Mr. Um, Scott? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, is there anything in here uh, on penalties or um, anything at all in this amendment that falls under our purview? Mr. Weeks, appeal process is in here, I think. Chair Lesh and, and Representative Scott, the <clears throat> amendment changes a number of substantive parts of House File 5 that are all um, protected by a private right of action for people who have their rights under the section violated. So in that regard, um, significant a part of the amendment would fall under um, this committee's purview for civil law. Okay, Chair Scott. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Well, I would move to um, that this committee would only take the parts of this amendment that apply to this and the rest of this amendment, um, um, I think, should um, cause this bill to go back to commerce since um, that has the major purview over this new system that we're setting up through this bill. And so I would move to strike all provisions of the amendment not relating to the judiciary. Uh, okay, Chair Scott has moved to strike all portions of this amendment not relating to judiciary. Can you specify which sections you want to strike, Chair Scott? Um, well, I would ask for House Research's help with that, but I guess that would be 
um, anything that has does not have to do with um, appeals on page 11.7 <coughs> through 11.14. And um, I know uh, Mr. Weeks pointed out something about private right of action. So if that's in here, I'm not sure the, the page and line of that. But it sounds like those are the only two areas of this amendment that apply. Okay, so can you just restate what your amendment is? You want to strike 11.7 through 11.14 and... and I want to strike all of um, the A8 amendment except for 11.7 um, through 11.14. And then if Mr. Weeks could point out the area that um, applies to uh, the private right of action. That would also be my um, amendment, uh, that portion to... Um, save and delete everything else okay um so so chair scott just to restate so i understand it uh you're going to delete everything in the aid i meant it with the exception of lines 11.7 <coughs> to line 11.14 <coughs> that is yep. that is the motion all in favor signify by saying aye aye, aye. all opposed say no no, no. division motion Mr. chair does not develop division has been called um all in, I forgot how we do division, just raise your hands, right? Yeah, right. okay. Um, all in favor, raise your hand. One, two, three, four, five, six. All opposed, raise your hand. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. The uh, uh, motion does not prevail. Um, Mr. Chair? Chair Scott. Um, that I would, um, I, I would move that this uh, bill be sent back to the Commerce Committee since this amendment primarily um, deals with um, things covered under that committee's purview, not ours. And since this is such a substantial, um, such a substantial um, e um, amendment, I just feel like it's not proper for our committee to be taking up something that's so substantially out of our purview. Okay, so the motion is that restate the motion. Uh, um, I would I would move that um, this bill and the this amendment um, be moved back to Commerce, that we wouldn't take this bill up this morning because it's, these changes are not under our purview. Okay, so that motion is out of order. Um, you can, we just voted down the amendment. Okay, so um, Mr. You Chair, can, then I would amend that. I'd just say that this bill needs to go back to Commerce and that should be the motion. Okay. Um, we can't send, this is supposed to go to Ways and Means. We can't even send it to Commerce, can we? No. Well, she moved it. It's going to send it to Commerce, even though we can't do it. So, okay. The motion is to send uh, House File 5 to Commerce. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say no. 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 Motion does not prevail. We're back to the amendment. Um, the A8 amendment. All in favor of the A8 amendment signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed say no. 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 Motion prevails. To your bill as amended, Representative Halverson. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. House File 5 is a bill for paid family and medical leave. Um, the purpose of the bill is to create um, a a system uh, which is tied to um, our current and longstanding um, unemployment insurance benefit. I shouldn't say tied to, but mirrored by our uh, longstanding um, unemployment insurance to provide paid family and medical leave for all Minnesota workers um, so that they can um, have a baby, deliver safely, um, take care of medical needs while they are pregnant, take care of their own medical needs. Um, if, a, if you are um, uh, diagnosed with cancer or a serious illness, um, if you have a family member who is diagnosed with cancer or has a serious illness, um, you would get to take up to 12 weeks of paid family and medical leave. Um, there are uh, small amounts of circumstances where a person could take up to um, 24 weeks, but that would um, ha necessitate a high-risk pregnancy coupled with a long-term 12-week uh, um, uh, medical leave. And um, all of the leave requirements um, are processed through an application from DEED. Um, they're certified by a medical um, professional and uh, 
the leave is um, affirmed through an application process. Um, the We have heard um, m many times from small employers who are looking for this kind of option and in order to complete compete in the workplace. And we've also heard from many folks who are caregivers or who uh, manage caregivers who recognize that um, there is a tremendous cost that's being paid by Minnesota workers and Minnesota employers because Minnesotans have to choose between having a paycheck and caring for a loved one or caring for themselves. This makes it so that Minnesotans don't have to choose. And or excuse me, uh, Mr. Chair, I understand that there are just certain parts of this bill that are under your purview. However, I would say that um, although the amendment is long, um, we have worked uh, very hard with stakeholders every stop along the way and made um, promise changes based on discussion and uh, would uh, will carry other um, ideas um, and changes um, from this committee forward to the next. Our next stop is um, uh, Ways and Means with a, a, a a uh, recommendation to jobs. Um, one of the reasons this is a, such a long amendment is that it actually conforms much of what was in the bill, much of the definition to paid family and medical leave um, at the federal level. I shouldn't say paid, unpaid, the, the family medical leave. And so it was uh, requests from employers who said we want to have um, language and definitions that we're familiar with. And so this um, hopefully will help uh, cut down on the number of compliance officers that people need because empl uh, employers are already working with this language in other parts of law. That is a brief opening, okay. Mr. Chair. Okay, thank you very much. Do you have other testifiers? I do, Mr. Felton? Chair. Um, if you could bring them up and speak to just those portions of the bill that are under the purview of this committee. Please come, come up to the testifiers table. If you have another one who's gonna come and testify after this, Rep Representative Halverson, please have them be ready to go. So come on, go ahead and take your seat and introduce yourself for the record. Begin your testimony to those portions of this bill that are before the committee. Welcome. Good morning, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. My name is Christy Hall, and I am the senior staff attorney at Gender Justice, a legal advocacy organization. And I'm here to, um, to testify about the enforcement mechanisms in this bill, including a private right of action. I think enforcement mechanisms are essential to the operation of, uh, you know, of a, of a new law like this. And I think enforcement mechanisms are in everybody's interest. Um, you know, if people are able to gain a competitive advantage by violating the law with no consequences, that only harms uh, employers who uh, are looking to follow the law. So I think both for the benefit of people who want to um, um, er, use their earned uh, time here and for employers as well who want to follow the law, um, the private right of action is an essential enforcement mechanism. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. Um, I will be available if there are questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Hall. Next testifier, please state your name, begin your testimony. My name is Daniel Swenson Clatt. I'm the owner of Butter Bakery Cafe in Minneapolis. And thank you, uh, Chairperson Lesh and members any? of the committee. <laughs> you didn't bring any? <laughs> Nothing today, unfortunately. I was I was uh, uh, stepping in for another member who was going to testify today, and if, had I planned, I would have thought about it, especially lemon bars, perhaps. But <laughs> Wait, um, please don't rub salt. <laughs> I'm <laughs> I'm actually here today uh, with a cook who is ready to go on parental leave <laughs> at any point. He uh, announced yesterday dilation had begun and they were getting ready. Um, I unfortunately have, as a small business owner, really have no mechanism to handle paid medical family leave, but we're going to do it. Um, I'm going to give him three weeks and pay for him. Um, it's going to be costly, um, but he's valuable to me. He's one of my four cooks. Uh, he, I hope he will be back because it's a hard position to fill. And so this is if I had a little more support at a state level, like I do for work comp, when one of my bakers spilled some caramel on her hand, uh, I would, <laughs> I'd find my business a little less complex and uh, a little less concerning and perhaps would remember lemon bars on days like this. Um, Again. I've trusted the system to work for me for uh, working with unemployment requests, with working with work comp requests. Uh, I check a little box in my payroll system, I fill out a couple forms and things work. I've been very happy to have that happen over the last 13, 14 years. Paid family medical leave, 
I had three folks go out last year do it for paid medical leave as well uh, for babies. Uh, it's nice to have children being born into our shop, uh, but it's really complex. And I can't say that my filing and my data systems and my uh, national headquarters at my house do a very good job of it. I'd really prefer to have the systems behind me uh, that I have at the state level. I trust Deed, they've done a good job for me. Um, I appreciate that you're using that system as a way to make this work. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony, Mr. Spencer Platt. Uh, who? President Lucero. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Question for the testifier. You know, let's wait until yeah. the end. Can we wait until all testifiers come up? I've got. I'll wait. Uh, thank you. I got Nikki Shiljong Nim. Did I say that right? It's, I'm not making, uh, Nikki, but. Oh, so no, probably. I'm Sarah Piepenberg. Um, well, you're not on the list. Morning. Okay. Wait, are you going to speak to just the portions of this bill yep. that we have? Okay, go ahead. Um, my Tell name me is your Sarah name again. Sarah. My name is Sarah Piepenberg. Um, I own a small retail oil and vinegar shop uh, in Minneapolis, Excelsior and Navarre. Um, I've testified before why I think we need this based on um, my employees. Um, but I'm here today to say that I trust that Deed can create a system to, to keep employee data safe. They're currently doing it already and they have systems in place to keep unemployment records and data safe. This shouldn't be a question or concern if we're not questioning or concerning, or have concerns about what they're currently doing. Um, the bigger issue is we need a statewide paid family and medical leave. Minnesota has the opportunity to set the bar for paid family and medical leave. We have great systems already in place. Um, we've set the bar for voter turnout, uh, and I think uh, one of the reasons is because we have systems in place like same-day voter registration. We as Minnesotan, Minnesota and the legislature can create these systems. We have proof that it's working um, in many, many other areas. And um, I just want to say that I feel like DEED has the capacity and the understanding and the ability to do the right thing um, in creating a system. Because right now, you're entrusting me um, as an employer to keep my employees' data safe, which consists of a locked file cabinet. Uh, there's not a whole lot of safety in that. Um, so I urge you um, to continue this discussion, and I hope that we can pass paid family and medical leave. Thank you for your testimony, Ms. Piepenberg. Uh, Nancy Lepping, Commissioner Lepping, I should say. Welcome back to the committee, Commissioner Lepping. Mm -hmm. If you could just keep your testimony restricted yes. to the portions of the I bill will. that we have. Thank you. So, good morning, um, Chair and members. Um, I'm Nancy Lepping, Commissioner of the Minnesota Department of Labor and Industry. Um, the, this bill is a cornerstone of the Walls Flanagan. Um, uh, uh, administration's um, legislative agenda for this session. Um, this bill provides for leave that is not a nice to have, but it's a need to have. Um, the portions of the bill related to data practices and sharing of data between the Department of Labor and the Department of um, Employment and Economic Development are critical to their and important to their efficient and effective administration and enforcement of the bill and will create efficiencies for workers and employers because this will mean that in information related to applying for this leave can be shared between the Department of Labor and Department of um, Labor and Industry and Department of Deed and will not obligate these workers and employers to provide this information twice, once to the Department of Labor and once to the Department of Employment of employment and economic development. Also, with regard to the enforcement and compliance authority that's set out in the bill for both DEED and the Department of Labor, these will be um, critical provisions for protecting the rights of workers, but also to assist employers in meeting their responsibilities under the Act. So consequently, the Department um, of Labor and Industry, and I speak also for the Department of, uh, of Employment and Economic Development, that these are provisions that are important to our effective and efficient um, administration and enforcement of the bill. So thank you. Thank you very much for your testimony, Commissioner mm -hmm. Lepping. Um, is there anyone else in the audience mm -hmm. yeah. who uh, wishes to testify on this bill related to the items before this committee? Seeing none, then uh, Representative Lucero, your question. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I guess the question would be for uh, bo uh, both of the first two testifiers. They both had made comments to the effect of they trust 
uh, deed to protect their data more than they could. And my question is, given the track record of government technology systems, such as MinLars, such as MinSure, such as uh, other age, uh, government systems that we've seen who've all suffered data breaches, why do you believe that government can protect better given their poor track record than you could? Mr. Swenson Klatt. Thank you for your question and indeed uh, my son uh, spent many months waiting for his driver's license and was a little, a little frustrated at the system. Um, I'm really actually after 14 years of working with the unemployment system, with the work comp system, with the all of the state income taxes and things that come back and forth, I believe that structure has been in place well enough to support our business pretty well. I don't think adding this layer is going to make an effect on that. I don't see that happening. Mr. Lucero. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Then to the bill author, uh, with the amendment, I haven't had the chance to go through it. But with the original language, my understanding is that this would be a completely new yeah. technology system, not part of any additional or add-on to an, any existing system. Can you confirm that's still the case, or is my understanding correct with no. the adoption of the amendment? Mr. Chair. Okay, hold on. Um, Representative Halverson, go ahead first. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, the um, amendment does not change how um, this system is being built. Um, and the way it's being built is it's being built as a parallel to something that has worked in Minnesota for uh, over 80 years, I believe, and that is um, unemployment insurance. We have had systems in place um, to um, apply for and um, distribute um, unemployment insurance benefits. And this is uh, being built to mirror that already very successful program. So it isn't um, all brand new. It's um, something that is being um, built in parallel with another program. Representative Liebling. Thank you, uh, Mr. Thank Chair, you Mr. Chair. I just wanted to correct a statement before we go on. As far as I'm aware, there were no data breaches in MinLars or MinSure. There are other mm -hmm. issues, but uh, you know, we, we don't, certainly MinSure, I don't recall a data breach and we're checking, but you know. Good point. Um, and Mr. Chair. Chair. Some of this Mr. is Chair. the uh, problem of, of private contractors, too, I think, as well. But Mr. Chair. Uh, Chair Mr. Scott. Thank you. That's inaccurate. There was a data breach very early in the beginning with MinSure where someone inadvertently sent um, hundreds of people's Social Security numbers and names out to several insurance companies, insurance providers, I guess, the, the agencies is a more accurate word. And um, I don't know about MinLar specifically, but the Department of Public Safety, um, the Division of um, uh, Motor Vehicle Services, had a very large data breach online where you could go online and find other people's information. They were posting online, they had available online people's personal information um, without their knowledge. So this has already happened, um, and uh, I just wanted to point that out. So you're saying they have a better track record than Facebook or Target. Representative Lucero. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. So I, what, that's exactly what I was going to say is, yes, there was a data breach. And Representative Liebling, I've actually been tracking the different data breaches and failures of state agency technology systems. And so I think it's a misplaced uh, uh, idea that government can protect your data better than a smaller agency or smaller uh, system from an employer. Uh, so uh, then I guess continuing on with the question to the bill author, uh, the bill author just referenced that this is a system that would be built in parallel, but my understanding from reading the language, and I'm looking for my highlights here, that there's an explicit exclusion, there it is, it's uh, on the original bill now, I don't know if it changed with the amendment, but it's line 10.6 and 10.7, there's an explicit exemption from using uh, Minute and other technology systems. So my understanding is that this proposal would be a new system with new servers, new network, new staff, new code. While you can say that the idea in concept is similar to an existing, the technology system itself would be brand new. Is that correct? Representative Halverson. Mr. Chair and Representative Lucero, that is um, up to the department. Representative Lucero. Uh, okay, then I guess my uh, third question, and I'll end for now, would be, we've heard several references to deed, but my understanding from the bill language is it's the Department of Commerce and the Department of uh, Labor and Industry that's in scope here, not deed. Is that correct? That would be the 
controllers or builders of this technology system. Representative Halverson. Uh, Mr. Chair and Representative Lucero, um, uh, no, it, it would be the Department of Economic uh, Employment and Economic Development um, just uh, that would house this program just as uh, UI is housed there. And uh, the Department of Labor and Industry would uh, be responsible for any um, enforcement and uh, oversight. Representative Lucero, so just last clear. question. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. So the, just to be clear, that the technology system would be built, managed, and run by DEED. Representative Robertson. Uh, Mr. Chair, Representative Lucero, um, just as UI is currently, yes. Okay. Thank you. Chair Johnson. Chair Lash, um, members, I, I do have a question for the two testifiers that own businesses. Go, come on up. Go ahead, ask your question while they're coming down, Chair Johnson. Oh, they talked how, how good this program would be for their business. I'm just wondering, and how good it would be for their employees. I'm wondering if they're offering this now, because I, there is a lot of business uh, that offer programs like this in the private industry, and also in the, in the uh, uh, public, public as well. I'm just wondering if, if they are offering it now to their employees. Mr. swenson Clatt or uh, Ms. Peppenberg, go ahead. Um, uh, Yes, actually. Um, I have an employee right out, out right now who's out on 12 weeks. Um, she had a hip replacement and is going to be followed by knee replacement. I'm paying for her right now out of pocket, um, covering then her shifts, trying to find child care. If this system was in place, it would be less expensive actually for me. I have as a business owner for the last 10 years researched opportunities through private insurers to do this. It is unaffordable, crazily unaffordable. This equates to about a cup of coffee a week for me as an employer. I'm willing actually to even pay more because what is offered on the private market is unacceptable. It would be over $400 a month for me to get a two week paid family or medical leave through private insurance companies. So please trust for the last 10 years, I have absolutely been looking. This is an affordable option for me as a business owner. Chair Johnson. Okay. So if I know, I know a lot of companies that offer the short term disability. Mm -hmm. And none of them are paying that price. Um, I don't know where you're getting your quotes, but I'd uh, change insurance companies. Um, that is uh, very much out of line. Um, you're talking about how much you're talking about how expensive it is for you and that you don't want to pay for this or you want you'll pay a little bit, not okay. the whole, not the whole whole fare that an offer that you're offering your employees. So if you're not going to pay for it, who do you want to pay for it? No, this well, is an affordable Ms. option. Sorry, it's just a whole little game we play here in Sorry. committee. It's like you go through the chair and then I call him in and I call on you. It's like a little game thing. Sorry, go ahead, Ms. Piepenberg. Um, this, at a rate of 0.031%, um, is, is um, one of those opportunities, because I am going to provide it regardless if anybody else is going to help me, because it's the right thing to do for our employees. I have a retail business with an 87% turnover rate. I don't have turnover. The reason being is because I pay more than minimum wage. I am flexible as far as sick time. Minneapolis did not have to dictate to me to have a paid sick time. We have these policies. This is a policy that I would like to offer my employees and it's at a rate that is affordable. For businesses that already have paid family and medical leave and those kinds of things, they have the opportunity to opt out. All they have to do is prove that they're providing the minimum. And this for me is a bar that we can set in the state of Minnesota. And we have had other business owners testify um, to that effect, that they can actually offer more to their employees, because right now they're only offering three to four weeks. This would be an affordable option to give their employees up to 12 weeks paid leave. The other piece for me as a business owner, I have the opportunity to purchase it for myself. And as a business owner, I will be also putting my name in um, this if this passes. 
Chair Johnson. Are uh, you, uh, Chair Lesh, run to the testifiers. You explained, showed one of the problems. Good employees allow for good packages to keep their employees. Now, if we do something like this, and uh, if you're going to go in this, there's no incentive for your employees to stay. They can move around because it's the way this is set up. Their benefits move with them. And as a business, if I was a business owner and I'm looking for new employees, I go through the system huh? and look what their benefits they have racked up. Good employee, you're going to have to be a very good employee for me to even consider take, hiring somebody that could work for two days and they're going to be out for 12 weeks. If you don't think people would look at that, you're crazy. Well, okay. But I mean, what I will say this as I finish up here, just one <laughs> final statement. A lot of companies have got away from sick time. They've gone to personal time off. There's a reason for that because sick time is the number one abused perk that there is. When I worked in, in uh, law enforcement, I worked on a 28-day rotating schedule. My partner was there a lot longer than I was. He worked the opposite side of it. We worked for four days at a time. That four days out of 28 days, we were together. Three and a half of those days, he usually took a sick day. When he actually needed sick time, he didn't have any because he used it up because he abused it. I ended up with, uh, I didn't abuse my sick time. Up until I had neck surgery for a double fusion in my neck, I had given more sick time away than I had used. But I had it available for when I needed it. The problem is, is the abuse of the system that's causing this, and I don't. And this isn't. This is going to stop the abuse, and it's going to make actually things worse. I believe. Rips of her. Rips of her. Thank you, Chair Lash. And I guess I'm just a little bit baffled by the line of questioning that just happened here, and I don't really know what's going on. But I do just want to say that last year, St. Paul, I was the policy director for Mayor Carter. We passed $15 minimum wage last year, year before the earn sick and save time. We know that we keep asking our businesses to actually do more for employees because we know that especially in the small business, medium-sized businesses, it is really difficult and margins are really small. And depending on which industries you're in, the margins are even smaller, right? And so when I see small businesses do what all of you are doing and saying we've been looking for options, we're trying to do best by employees. We know that when we take care of our employees, morale is up. The people choose to say, we, we understand all of the great benefits that come with this. So I guess I'm just a little bit confused about the, the questioning and, and the interrogating um, as if you're doing something wrong here. And I just wanted to congratulate you and thank you because even in the city of St. Paul, we're looking now to say, how do we pull, right? Large businesses have the ability to pull employees so that they can get lower rates, they can get better insurance, they can get better benefits. You don't have that option in small businesses. And so to be able to, for us as a state to say, what can we do? Because we've been asking more out of you every single day, every single year, that what can we do to help support all of you? So I really just appreciate the efforts that are being done here. I appreciate this bill being brought forward and I appreciate the work that's being done here. And I guess I guess my, my only question would be is that, um, um, you know, the, the way this is set up, do you, do you all feel like it is the right structure to allow your businesses to continue to flourish, but to treat your employees well. And uh, you know, and do you feel that this would be the right tool in order to do that? Ms. Piepenberg. I absolutely do feel like this would be the right tool. And um, if I can address some of his questions or concerns, um, we're vilifying employees. Um, we're just yep, right now, what we're doing is setting a bar. Can I, this is I'm going to, here, members, here's the deal. Yeah. We've already gone way over the time we have allotted for this bill, and we've also gone way far afield of why this bill is here. So, Ms. Piepenberg, if you can speak uh, to, the, to the question as it relates to why we're here. I permitted Chair Johnson wide latitude, uh, but considering where we are, where we are, I'd like to narrow that back in. So can you speak to the question as it relates to the data practices or creation of the data set? Well, I, I just, I, yes, I do feel that this gives me an opportunity. In, in looking through private insurance, this is an affordable option for me as an employer. Okay, uh, Representative Considine. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I'm always amazed when you have somebody that has a, ben a benefit, has benefited through their own their whole career, and then wants to deny it to other people. Thank you. Any, um, Representative O'Neill, did you have a question or comment? 
go ahead. Yes, and then Mr. We're Chair, vote. to to the bill and actually to the sections that we're supposed to be addressing. Thank you. You're That's welcome, awesome. Chair. Um, so I actually have a real question <laughs> to the bill author. Thank you for bringing this. If you could look at page 10, and I'll give you exactly page in line. Um, I'm just trying to understand some process things that relate directly to this committee. Mm -hmm. Page line, excuse me, page 10, line 25 through 29, talks about records release. And I'll, are you there? I don't want to do it. Yep. Uh, okay, Thank perfect. Okay, so <laughs> I just don't want you to be lost in what we're talking about. So specifically to records release. Now, um, you say that an individual whose medical records are necessary to determine eligibility, and it goes on from there. So um, unlike unemployment insurance, where the individual is applying for themselves, this could be someone applying for someone else, maybe a spouse, maybe a child, maybe someone they're caring for. Um, can you explain to me the process that you would get someone's medical records that are not your own? And, and your, have you thought through that process? Um, and then retention. So once those medical records have been provided, uh, I don't believe in the, the bill it addresses how long retention is for these very private records. <laughs> And if you could speak to those two aspects. Representative Halverson. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. And I think um, I would like to introduce um, Ms. Fitzpatrick to um, speak to the ahead, um, technical Patrick. support of the bill. Uh, Mr. Chair, members of the committee, my name is Deborah Fitzpatrick. I co-direct the Center on Women, Gender, and Public Policy at the Humphrey School and uh, had the contract to do the design and implementation study on this policy for the state of Minnesota in 2016. Uh, so, Representative O'Neill, uh, the uh, actually the care recipient is the one who has to sign off on the um, uh, uh, sharing of their data. So it's kind of a two-part process for those folks that are applying for benefits to take care of another person. The, the care recipient actually is the one that has to, um, in that case, uh, uh, um, approve of their medical information being shared. Um, and usually in these cases, the actual data, the actual medical record isn't shared, but information about the person's condition is shared, which is a function of how long that employee or that care you know, giver uh, would need to be out. And that is related to the type of medical condition that they have. Mr. Chair. Representative O'Neill. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just a follow-up on that. I, I don't see that language in the bill. Maybe you could point to where care recipient is in it and defined so that's clear because in section, uh, subsection 6, which was 10.25 uh, through 10.29, it, it just says individual. It doesn't say the care recipient. Uh, maybe that clarification would be important. Um, and I, I have a little bit of concern that 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 it's more of, not anecdotal, but it's more of a story as opposed to actual substantiation from medical records, that there's actually an issue going on. And um, if that's truly the case, that in the language itself, it actually says authorizing a release of medical records. So it's different. The language is different than what you just described. And I'm a little confused because one is kind of telling a story, well, this is the condition and this is how long it's been going on. But this is, it actually says authorization of release of medical records or other records. If you could clarify that. Ms. Oh, who are you asking? Ms. To the author, sorry. I, okay, I go ahead, Rip some Halverson. Uh, Mr. Chair and Representative O'Neill, the, the process that's laid out through the um, uh, bill actually um, uh, requires sign off from a medical practitioner. So it's not just anecdotal, it's actually um, uh, driven by um, the uh, authorization of practitioners like we do with um, other types of benefits in the state. And um, this is an as um, necessary. So it is a, um, if for some reason um, the application um, needs more research or a, um, uh, appeal needs more um, documentation in order for somebody's appeal to be successful if their benefits were denied. Um, they, there may be required more authorization but or more um, records, but the records are not um, deemed uh, required at the outset. It's only um, if they are necessary further in the process. Rep. Sam O'Neill, last question. Absolutely. Just to wrap up. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So uh, I, do, I still have a concern about retention. It's not specifically laid out in the bill as far as how long that data could be retained, because you are talking about very private medical records, um, not just an anecdote of their condition. And so uh, I would guess 
I think that's something that should be spelled out in that. I'd appreciate that uh, moving forward. And, and maybe that you have a thought as to how long that might be. I don't know. But. Um, Mr. Chair, Representative O'Neill, quickly, I would just um, say that um, I will uh, talk to uh, the, the commissioner and um, get some information and also um, see how HIPAA um, fits into this as well, because it's got uh, language that's similar to HIPAA in terms of the limited extent necessary. And so we will look into that for you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Chair Scott. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I have a couple questions, one with the appeals process and one with um, employer penalties. Um, to start with the appeals process, on line 13.21 to 22, it says the commissioner may adopt rules on procedures for hearings. The rules need not conform to common law or statutory rules of evidence and other technical rules of procedure. And I'm just wondering, since those, those um, traditional uh, uh, laws or rules of um, a hearing process uh, for it to be fair and equitable are not going to be applied here. What guarantees do we have that the appeals process will be fair? And do other statutes give the uh, commissioner uh, similar authority and power? Well, okay. I mean, did, Ms. Fitzpatrick, did you want to answer that? I mean, well, uh, Mr. Chair, members of the committee, I just want to say that uh, for the for for the most part, this appeals process that's picked up in this bill is coming from UI, and so that language that you're referencing, uh, just confirmed with uh, Ben Weeks, is uh, basically building off of that same kind of a um, uh, exclusion in UI. Okay. Thank you. Scott. And um, then, Mr. Chair, if I could go to um, the section on page 21. Um, and I apologize, I haven't written in the lines if any of this has changed with the 13-page amendment or not. Um, but on lines 21, starting at 1 point, or 21.16, talks about the employer penalties. And um, is that also, um, is this also similar to unemployment insurance? Representative Halverson. Anyone? Conferring with wanna, staff. Okay, we're conferring. We're calling a friend. Mr. Chair, Representative Scott, no, these are not from UI. Um, these are new penalties that would be available to the Commissioner um, of Employment and Economic Development for non-compliance with a employer's adoption of a private plan to provide the same benefits that are provided under the bill, but they're new. It's a new concept. Okay, thank Mr. you. Scott, thank question. you. And. Um, Thanks, Mr. Chair. And so um, I'm just wondering, is um, number one to the bill's author, are the, is this section addressed in the 13-page um, uh, amendment? Um, and if so, where? And then I'd also like to hear if there's anybody in the audience from the business community, I'd like to hear their thoughts on the employer penalty section of this, of this bill. Well, um, Chair Scott, we're way over time, so I'm not going to call for anyone to uh, give their thoughts on it. If you have a specific question for someone, go ahead and ask that question. Okay. Um, uh, Ms. Larson, um, if she's available from, I, I, uh, from Chamber or Business Partnership, I forget what. Okay, what's your question, Chair Scott? Um, I'd just like to get their feedback on the employer penalty section of this bill. Since that does apply to our Go committee. ahead, Ms. Larson. Welcome to the committee. Please Thank you, Mr. Your Chairman, name. members. I am Jill Larson with the Minnesota Business Partnership. Yeah, we do have some concerns with the penalty section in the bill. Um, we do feel like the penalties are a little onerous. The way the bill's drafted right now, um, it will make it very difficult for an employer to have a private plan for those employers that want to be able to provide their own benefits to their employees. Uh, there's a lot of hoops to jump through and um, there are a lot of the penalties in the bill really create a disincentive for an employer to have a private plan, um, including the commissioner's ability to revoke a plan and not allow a plan to be reapplied for for three years. Um, it's not clear under what conditions um, a plan would be able to be revoked. So we are concerned. We think some of these um, penalties are a little onerous. And um, you know what, what we believe should just be a wage replacement proposal uh, we feel has kind of turned into more of a um, um, some some pretty uh, bureaucratic and, and um, penalizing provisions against employers who are actually providing the benefit now. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Representative Lucero, you have the last question. 
Uh, thank uh, you, Mr. Chair. Because you already spoke. I, I was just going to say, I'll just save my questions for the House floor because it'll go beyond okay. what you're looking thank for. Thank you, thank you. Representative Lucero. Um, there being no other comments, what? Did we ask if anyone else is coming to come up and testify on it, didn't we? Yeah, we did. Yeah, Bye. we did that. Okay, um, the chair will renew his motion that House File 5, as amended, be re-referred to... Oh, well, Mr. Chair, we didn't offer my amendment. I had the um, A9. You didn't offer your amendment, oh. Chair Scott. <laughs> well, is there opportunity for me to offer that amendment, I'm Mr. Chair? I'm not your water for you here. What's the A9? <laughs> the A9... Um, what it would do is require that the data must be uh, encrypted when it travels from one entity, one agency to the other. Um, and uh, then there's some other uh, provisions in this that we've been putting in statute anytime that data is being shared. We've traditionally been doing this in the last few years, Mr. Chair. Um, establish written procedures, um, you know, role-based access, um, audit trails, those sorts of things that are in this amendment. And so I would offer the A-9. Okay. And after uh, people Mr. support. Scott offers uh, the A-9 amendment. Any discussion? Seeing none, uh, all in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed say no. 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 Motion does not prevail. We're back on the bill. House renews his motion. The House file fought. Chair, what did I say? House renews? <laughs> not House. Chair renews his motion. That House File 5, as amended, be re-referred to Ways and Means. All in favor, say aye. 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 All opposed, say no. No. Motion passes. You're on your way. Thank you, Representative Halverson. Next bill is Representative Becker Finn's House File 1503, Tribal Access to Vital Record Data. Chair moves House File 1503 be recommended to be placed on the General Register. Representative Becker Finn, to your bill. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, you guys are fun. Yeah, um, <laughs> uh, so House File 1503 um, would essentially give uh, tribal uh, health departments and um, tribal governments access, the same access to important birth data that um, other local governments currently have. Okay, excellent. you have a testifier, Representative Becker Finn? Um, I do uh, have a testifier, although I don't know if people have... Um, She's mostly here to answer questions. Uh, we're Just trying questions. Anyone have questions? What, what's your name, Testifier? Good morning. Um, I'm Molly Crawford. I'm the state registrar for the Minnesota Department of Health Office of Vital Records. Excellent. Anyone have any questions for the author or for Ms. Crawford on this bill? Uh, Chair Johnson. Uh, Chair Lash, Representative Becker Finn. I'm just wondering uh, if you know why tribal officials aren't allowed this data currently um i didn't hear the question say again chair johnson i was just wondering if uh, representative becker finn knew why the uh, uh tribal officials are not allowed that data at this time oh do you know the answer to that question Representative becker finn uh mr chair Representative lewick i believe or uh, represent johnson i believe it's um and it, it's an oversight. We have we have a long way to go in recognizing tribal sovereignty and um, the way we treat tribal governments. Chair Johnson, I'm not sure. Chair Lash, Representative Becker, I'm not sure if it's an oversight or not. But it would have to be a two-way street. Uh, right now, we had an incident in uh, not far from my district where the state was asked to go in to audit an issue in one of the tribal grounds, and the state. Uh, auditor's office in, informed the uh, jurisdiction that was looking for the audit that the state did not have authorization because they were a sovereign nation. Thank you. Any other questions for the author or for the question taker? Ms. Crockford. Seeing none, then Chair renews his mo Oh, Representative Her. Thank you, Chair Lash. Uh, Representative becker -Finn, I just had a, a quick question because I know I was doing research on um, birth data as I was working in the college savings account for the city of St. Paul. And um, birth records that are, uh, so children born to parents who are married, those records are always public. But children born to uh, a parent who is not married, that that, parent, that data is actually private, uh, confidential, which means even the child doesn't have access to that data until they turn 
18 and they requested themselves. And so um, I'm just curious as to, uh, and so, and, and we wanted to use that data actually to do something really good for children born in St. Paul. I guess I was just curious as to how, um, is this different, does this then change that for just tribal nations? Because right now, a child, children born to a single mother, that data still is not, is not, is private right now. And then the uh, the second question is just that for the birth records that are being asked here to be made public, is it just for like tribal, like tribal use of it for specific, for something specific, or is it just so that they can have access to the data so that they can uh, do something with it? I, I just want to make sure I maybe understand a little bit. Ms. Crockford. Happy to answer that, Chairman. Um, Members of the committee, um, the statute now currently carves out very specific data classifications for vital records. And um, the representative is correct. Um, births to married mothers are public uh, birth records for the children. Births to unmarried mothers default to confidential unless that mother chooses to make that child's birth record public at the time of the birth registration. Um, this bill does not change any of that. What this bill does is allow us at the Department of Health to share birth data with tribal entities like we already share for local, state, and federal government entities. Um, it is very specific about the type of data that can be shared. Um, the health data on the records is used for um, public a local public health and it would be used for tribal public health in their um, work with um, home visiting and working with families to assure that they have the support and services they need. Um, other information such as demographic and um, names would be shared with tribal entities like we share currently for um, child support under the Department of Human Services with the county offices. The changes would also allow public birth records to have um, certificates issued to tribal, local, state, and federal, federal government entities for the purposes of doing the work that those agencies do. Thank you, Representative Her. Um, thank you, Chair Lash. I just wanted to say that I think that this is such a, um, I, I completely support this bill and what it's trying to do. As we move towards understanding that in order for us to, to support the systemic changes that we want to make right within our structures, that we have to start at birth. And that we have to do that in order to that we need to have access to birth records so that we can identify children who may be at most vulnerable most, or most at risk and to be able to provide the supports and the services that they need from the minute that child is born. And so I really appreciate the efforts being made in this and, the, and how this is going to be used and, and, um, and how it's going to operate in the lives of people who really need this. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, any other questions? Uh, seeing none, then the chair renews his motion that House File 1503 be recommended to be placed on the general register. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed say no. Motion passes. You're on your way. Thank you, Representative uh, Becker-Finn. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, we now have House File 1138, uh, Representative Fisher. Is here, yeah, he's here. Um, do we have a motion to place uh, House File 1138 on the general register? Motion. Representative Newer moves that House File 1138 be placed on the general register. The bills before us, you have an A3 amendment? Yes, I do, Mr. Chair. Okay. You can move um, someone offer the A3 amendment? Representative Newer also offers the A3 amendment. Um, do you want to explain the amendment? Uh, yes, very quickly. Thank you, Mr. Chair. This is an author's amendment which clarifies the exclusion section of the bill. This is language that has been agreed to between various proponents of the bill, Medical Alley and Medtronic, to help address some of the uh, concerns from the medical industry. Okay. Any questions? No. Then, Representative Neuer's motion is that the uh, we pass the A3 amendment. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed say no. Motion passes. The A3 amendment is adopted to your bill as amended, Representative Fisher. Thank you, Mr. Chair Committee. I appreciate the, the opportunity to present House File 1138. Uh, the purpose of this legislation is fourfold to give consumers the choice, especially in greater Minnesota, of where to bring their electronic products when they require repair, to support and grow small businesses' jobs, to guarantee free market access, and to help reduce the growing amount of e waste that is king, harming our environment. House File 1138 requires original equipment manufacturers known as e 
OEMs to make available instructions, parts, and tools to independent repair businesses and or consumers to fix electronic equipment. The bill does not force trade secrets to be revealed, no computer source code is exposed and data privacy is protected and last but not least, the liability of the manufacturer is protected. Members, there is also national and state precedence for this bill. Uh, House File 1138 is similar to a bill in Massachusetts which requires auto manufacturers to share information, parts and tools with local car repair shops. And as you see in one of the handouts, federal laws and regulations as well as state law already speak to the issue of House File 1138 and product liability. Bottom line, Mr. Chair and committee members, if you can choose where to get the best services for your car needs, you should be able to choose where you get your phone or anything else electronic fixed with all necessary and accessible information. Uh, Mr. Chair, to give you a little bit more perspective, I do have several testifiers with me. Uh, please bring them up. Okay. I've got, I've got uh, let me see, Jennifer I Larson, Gary Wordish, Terry McCoolicky. Mikuleski. You're writing again, isn't it? Yeah, okay. Uh, Amos Briggs, Tim Schaefer. Uh, that's it. Take care, y'all. Don't say the same thing, okay? Welcome to the committee. Thank you. Good morning, Mr. Chairman and committee members. Thank you for the opportunity to talk to you about the Fair Repair Bill. My name is Jennifer Larson. I'm the owner and CEO of Vibrant Technologies. We are in the business of reselling refurbished servers, storage, and networking, and we employ 70 people, and we've been in business 20 years. Over that time, the OEMs, or original equipment manufacturers, have become increasingly monopolistic in their behavior, abusing their market power and forcing consumers to repair their products they purchase through their own OEM channels. I'm a very proud Republican and active, and I believe that government intervention is usually not the answer to most issues. I believe in free markets. But with the changes brought on by the digital age, manufacturers are increasingly able to eliminate our property rights. Once you've purchased their product, there is no longer a free market for anything else you want to do with it. No fully free market for repairing it, no fully free market for customizing it to suit your needs, and no fully free market to resell it. Through our inability to do whatever we please with our products, do we ever actually own them anymore? OEMs are abusing the intent of the Digital Millennium Copyright Act to restrict our ability to control the life cycle of the products and forcing on us their strategy of controlled obsolescence. It's extremely profitable for the OEMs, but it steals money from consumers at every step downstream. As the world becomes more digital, this issue will become bigger and more challenging. This bill is an important step to stand up to these abuses. It is beneficial for small businesses, it's good for the economy by giving lower cost alternatives to schools, nonprofits, startups, good for all consumers, and by extending the life cycle of technology, it's beneficial for our environment. It is only bad for the OEMs that want to squash the free market and run roughshod over our property rights of small businesses and consumers. I ask you for your support of the fair <laughs> repair bill. <laughs> Thank, Thank you, you very much for your testimony, uh, Ms. Larson. Gary Wirtish. We'll save questions at the end, members. Please introduce yourself for the record. Don't fall down. And uh, your testimony. Mr. Chair and uh, Representatives, uh, Gary Wordish, I'm president of the Minnesota Farmers Union and Farm Out in uh, Renville County. Been uh, doing that all my life. And times have changed from when I first started farming to now. You know, the equipment we drove then to the equipment we drive now, I certainly don't want to go back. You know, it's, uh, it's a pleasure driving the equipment. So I, technology is great. But it's also got a downside too, and I get <clears throat> what our members are asking for is a lot of times uh, right now there's so much data, everything's controlled by a computer or whatever it is, and uh, you can be down sometimes for a very simple thing, and you're, you know, time is money. Uh, just a few years ago, we had uh, one of our tractors that went down and uh, it was needed a new da software in a dash, needed a complete new dash, and. Uh, we had to wait a day before the dealer was able to come out and look at it. Then we had to wait another couple of days before we got the part and installed. So what we did, you know, at night we borrowed a neighbor's tractor and did our tillage at night and planted our own that tractor. So we were able to make it through. But granted, we probably weren't a large enough uh, farmer to have the dealer come out right away. But but our members are just asking for the opportunity to be able to look at some of the stuff. And granted, no, you know, some of the stuff is just to so tactical. They're not, not everybody's going to be able to want to do it. But just for the simple fixes that are out there that could keep you rolling would you know, be very much appreciated. Uh, 
you know, the spring and the fall, we're under heavy time crunch to get our crop planted and then harvested. And in the dealers, they can't, that's when they get their heavy load of uh, calls to fix equipment. And they can't hire enough technicians to have, I mean, it's not practical for them to double their load of technicians for those two seasons and the rest of the time just having them not doing anything. So I, we think this would provide an opportunity where we just, you know, we're not looking at uh, modifying the equipment. You know, I still remember uh, back in the old 806 days, there was a local mechanic named Hank. He'd crank on the pump and the, you know, the exhaust would come out just blacker and smoke and that's, you know, what a few farmers wanted that. But nobody's asking for that now. The equipment costs too much money now to do that. We're just, just asking for the basic right to have a chance to look at it and do some repair if, if possible. I will never use it, uh, but you know, there's people, <coughs> grandchildren that are out there, maybe, you know, they're there, they can go to tech school and come back on the farm and maybe they could, you know, maybe they would have the opportunity to do this. So then it's also the opportunity of starting new businesses around the state. There's some areas of the state where there's a lot of distance between dealerships and, and we get, you know, dealerships do a very good job. They do the best they can. You know, they have a chain of stores, maybe five, six, whatever it is, and then, you know, but every one of them stores won't, they have a part stocked within their system. So sometimes you have to drive significant ways to get that part. And you might still have to do that, but it would provide an opportunity to start uh, small businesses around the, around the state too, possibly to, uh, to work on, say, a John Deere or a Case tractor, in, uh, which would be good for greater Minnesota, another opportunity to provide uh, jobs. Thank you very much for your testimony, uh, Mr. Wordish. Terry Mikuleski. Mr. Chair, thank you, you for the opportunity to speak. <clears throat> My name is Terry Mikuleski. Uh, I'm a shareholder in a John Deere dealership in Southeast Minnesota. We have eight locations and 170 employees. And I have a couple points uh, germane to the legality of this bill. Manufacturers of farm construction and forestry equipment generally sell products through independently owned dealerships such as mine, based upon legal dealer agreements, mandating that a manufacturer now sells documentation, tools, and parts directly to independent repair providers as the bill would have them do, puts the manufacturer in direct violation of the contract they have with distributors themselves. On the other hand, requiring dealers like ourselves to sell these parts and our goods at cost equates to an impairment of the manufacturer's contract with the distributors such as myself. Under either scenario, this bill violates the impairment of contracts provision in the U.S. Constitution, Article 1, Section 10. Also, dealers as myself contract with the manufacturers for the right to distribute their equipment and provide warranty repairs and non-warranty services. As part of this agree agreement, we invest heavily in tooling, training, parts, and inventories so that we can effectively support our customers. In fact, just last year, SEMA alone spent over $80,000 in parts and service training alone. In return for these investments, we are able to purchase parts at wholesale prices and then resell them to the customer at reasonable market value, which of course takes into account the sizable investments we have made. Requiring dealers to sell goods at cost is a taking in violation of the U.S. Fifth Amendment Clause, which prohibits the government from taking private property for public use without just compensation. Furthermore, mandating that manufacturers allow independent repair providers access to OEM software without the protection of the dealer agreements, confidentiality clauses, and agreed upon terms of use that they have with the dealer, such as myself, is a forced transfer of intellectual property. This is a violation of the Theft of Trade Secrets Clarification Act of 2012, which amends the Economic Espionage Act of 1996. Yesterday I spoke to uh, a farmer customer who, <laughs> he actually has the tools that the previous testifier is asking for. These tools are available. You just gotta go buy them. They have virtually the same capacities that our technicians use to fix these tractors, except it doesn't give them access to embedded coding. Why is this important? According to the farm I talked to, he said, you don't want customers or any untrained person to have access to this embedded coding. Now, I'm gonna guess a lot of you haven't been in a tractor lately. 
so I'm going to kind of break it down for you. Um, well, I'll, I'll tell you what, um, Mr. Mikuleski, if you know, we have limited time on this bill. So if you can just state your reasons, okay, I'll and stay, I think I'll, you've, you've I'll got into those, but you know, we don't have. So if a customer um, goes in and changes the embedded coating um, on our self-driving tractors and they crash into uh, somebody else, who's liable for that? If uh, they change the embedded coating to uh, bypass the EPA's mandated regulations and the engine is damaged or uh, damaged beyond repair or damaged at all, who is liable for that? There's no digital footprint uh, with these mechanisms. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lesky, Mr. Mikuleski. That's um, basic contributory negligence. If I go in and screw around with the coating and then I crash the tractor, that's contributory ne negligence and I can't recover. So um, any other testifiers? Uh, Amos Briggs. Thank you, uh, <coughs> Mr. Chair. <coughs> Committee members, my name is Amos Briggs from Lockridge Grindle now and here today on behalf of the Minnesota South Dakota Equipment Dealers Association. I think Terry hit many of the um, concerns around legal ramifications uh, in a scenario where this were to become law in Minnesota, so I will not review those. Uh, just here to, uh, to state uh, that um, on behalf of the Equipment Dealers of Minnesota, uh, we oppose House File 1138 and um, appreciate your time. Great. Thank you for your testimony, Mr. Briggs. Tim Schaefer. Please, as soon as possible, introduce yourself for the record and begin your testimony. Sure. Mr. Chair, thank you for the opportunity to speak today. I'll keep my uh, statement brief. Um, I want to thank Representative Fisher for bringing this bill to committee and working with us on it. And I want to thank uh, all the folks who are part of this coalition who couldn't be here today. Um, just want to speak briefly to some of the legal questions. Uh, I think it's generally understood that contracts need to follow the law and contracts can be modified. So if this goes forward, contracts should reflect the fact that this is the law of the land. Uh, there's no affordability clause in this bill, so nothing requires the uh, manufacturers to sell at a particular price, only at fair and reasonable terms. Uh, and finally, last year, the U.S. Copyright Office ruled that repair is a legal act that does not violate copyright. Um, so there is a very well fleshed out body of law that says that repair is a protected act. This bill is just about getting people the things they need to actually make those repairs. So uh, yeah, with that said, I'm happy to take any questions that you have about the liability issues as well. But uh, I don't want to take up too much more of the time. Thank so, you, Mr. Schaefer. Thank Tony you. Quillis. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, and following your lead, I will be brief and try and stay to the purview of this committee. Um, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, my name is Tony Quillis, and I'm representing two entities here today, the Consumer Technologies Association and the Computer Technology Industry Association, better known as CompTIA. And there's a couple of points that we would like to touch on, uh, Mr. Chairman, and the first one would be the definition of fair and reasonable terms. We think that my definition of that and your definition of that, Mr. Chairman, I'm sure are different, um, but we have some concerns about the fair and reasonable terms, Mr. Chairman. Second, there is some exemptions for trade secrets, Mr. Chairman, but if you look at the language, it, sex, it says, except as necessary to provide documentation, parts, tools on fair and reasonable terms. If you cross back to documentation, that includes manuals, diagrams, reporting outputs and service source codes and any other similar information. So there is concerns there that we are going to have to, for free, provide proprietary information. Mr. Chairman, there is a new statute created under 325E.72. 325E is trade practices and 325F is consumer protection, which usually is enforced under the Department of Commerce for the most part. This would go through and have the enforcement go through the Attorney General under the restraint of trade and specifically the deceptive trade practices, which is concerning um, to our folks, Mr. Chairman. And then finally, um, under an authorized repair dealer, under those terms and contracts, 
we are able to compone we are able to control and have data privacy and security concerns addressed in those authorized uh, repair provider contracts and we're concerned that if we have to go and cough up all of our documentation that I had referenced earlier to go through that we are to um, independent repair providers that there are data privacy and security concerns mr. chairman with that I thank you for your time thank you for your testimony mr. Quillis um, anyone else in the audience okay one two anyone else raise your hand who wants to come down and be heard on this that's a really low hand there just get it up there be proud be proud loud proud okay Mr. Patrick, welcome to the committee. Mr. Chair, members, Bobby Patrick. I'm the director of uh, government relations for Medical Alley Association. I just want to come down and uh, briefly thank Representative Fisher for working with us on the language around the amendment you just adopted. Uh, it was uh, addressed the concerns uh, that we had and uh, limits it to only products that are manufactured for use in a medical setting. So uh, that's all, and just keep my comments brief. Thank Excellent. you, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much, Mr. Patrick. Come on down. State your name for the for the record. Begin your testimony. Oh, my name is Piper Klein. I am a high school student in St. Paul, and I do repair in my school. Um, like many organizations and schools, we really rely on technology that keeps our school running. And um, I go to a small school, so we can't afford to replace things when they break. So I run my school's tech team, where I fix a lot of the things. But I don't have access to the things that we need to fix, um, the materials and tools. And so this is why this is so important to me and other organizations and schools is because by having the access to the correct tools and parts, then we can keep fixing things instead of replacing them and change the culture away from throwing things away to repairing things. Excellent. Thank you very much for your testimony and be, be, be appearing in front of the committee. Are there any questions that members of the committee have for testifiers? Chair Johnson. Scott. Uh, Chair Lesh, um, I guess probably for the first testifier that we had, the uh, first. Jennifer Larson. Go ahead and ask your question. What's just coming? Well, uh, one thing I'm wondering a lot of this technology and, and the stuff that they're after in this <laughs> bill that provided, besides being some of it proprietary, it affects the warranties. I'm just wondering if we have to, if these uh, companies have to give this information out, the uh, person doing the repair is not authorized to repair service. Who's covering the warranty information if that $500,000 tractor is destroyed because of the uh, improper repairs done? Well, I mean, okay. I mean, Ms. Ms. Uh, Jennifer, you can answer that, but most of these warranties are void if you Screw around with it. Go, go ahead, Ms. Oh. Larson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, for my company, I warranty my own equipment. So most of what we buy, we buy back from large. If a uh, Fortune 500 company is, is refreshing, I buy their equipment back, break it down, rebuild it, and then I warranty it myself. So that's, that's what I, most of the companies in the industry do, is my understanding. Chair Johnson. Uh, Chair Lesh, members, but this isn't what this bill do, does. The way this bill is written, it takes brand new equipment, it malfunctions. Instead of bringing it to an authorized dealer, somebody could open it up and void the warranty, and that could be very costly to the individual. So I have a lot of concerns on this bill. Well, did you want to respond to that, Ms. Larson? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. That would be up to the individual and the free market to take it where he wants. Okay. Uh, Rips of Cantrell. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, thank you, Representative Fisher, for bringing this bill about. Um, I just wanted to say that uh, repair is, a, is an extremely lucrative industry, and uh, as a result, I believe it's important for us to ensure that there are not repair monopolies. Uh, as it pertains particularly to electronic waste and to, uh, more particularly, equipment, that has become more digitized, more, um, more electronic in terms of agricultural production, um, I think it's, it's essential in order to preserve the livelihood of, of many people who are the backbone of our country and the backbone of our agricultural system, um, that the tradition of being able to repair their equipment uh, is maintained in the digital age. So I just wanted to add that input and I wanted to thank you again. 
Thank you. Chair Scott. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And this, this reminds me of the, the automobile manufacturers versus the dealers a little bit. And the thing I guess that most concerns me is the issue of contracts and the contracts that um, John Deere would have with a dealer and that sort of thing. So that, that is a really um, a big concern for me. And that's a comment, but I do have one question, and that would be to the bill author. And I noticed that in the bill, um, it, it brings attention to the attorney general, um, that statute. And the attorney general can already enforce consumer protection. So I'm just wondering why um, it was necessary to add specific authority in, in this bill. Fisher. Uh, uh, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, uh, Representative Scott. I uh, just want to make sure that it was clearly spelled out so that people would know which way to go on it is, while sometimes things are outlined in different sections of the law, we want to make sure it was clear here so people would have that clear option. Chair Scott. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. It seems like we're doing an awful lot of that when it's already under the purview of the Attorney General's Office for Consumer Protection. It seems like I've, I've seen this a couple of times this year, and I'm just wondering why the why the special treatment, but thank you. Representative O'Neill. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Uh, Representative Carlson was first. Go ahead, Representative Carlson. Oh, that's okay. Um, I can wait until later. Representative O'Neill. I have a comment. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And it relates specifically to that section, too. This is on page 4. Uh, four point, line 4.7 through 4.9 um, to the bill author, if you could just explain um, what additional authority are you giving to the Attorney General, if any, and um, cause I, I see that you've specifically spelled it out, but what, is there any additional authority that you're giving that he doesn't already have? If you could just be very clear about that. Representative Fisher. I can help phone a friend on that. Okay, uh, Tim Schaefer. Hi, uh, my reading is that that does not give the Attorney General any additional authority. It just refers to the, uh, the statute for enforcement that already exists. Representative O'Neill. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So if we strike this language, it is a kind of a moot point because he already has authority over this? I, it's directing, oh, Mr. Chair, Mr. Chair apologies. Uh, it, my understanding, it's, it's directing the proper channel for enforcement, not creating a new channel for enforcement. So it's saying under this statute, this is where we should be enforcing uh, violations of, of the, the law. Representative O'Neill. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So, so you didn't really answer the question. So if we don't have this in there, would the Attorney General still have authority, as he does now, over this section of law? Or is this a new authority that you're now giving to the Attorney General? Mr. My, oh, sorry. My, my understanding is that it is a, uh, it's just a clarification. So striking it would make things less clear, and I don't think would improve the bill, but it would not remove his authority. Representative O'Neill. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Well, <clears throat> I'm not sure that that makes the bill any better. If he already has authority, then he already has authority. So to me, it just makes it more confusing to have it in as if, he now has more authority than he had before over an area where he didn't have before. Normally, we would put something in statute to say, you know, this is a new authority. This is a new section that you're now in, uh, over. So to me, it actually makes the bill more more confusing. So I just want to point that out. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Hill. Representative Carlson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I had the um, privilege of hearing this bill in commerce. So. Um, this is kind of uh, the second round for me, and and you know at the time, uh, kind of referred to this as the can-do bill. Um, I, I'm really intrigued by by this approach, and did offer um, in uh, to work with Representative Fisher on on this as it moves forward. Uh, you know, and again, but I am I am sensitive to um, the opposition towards this, uh, especially from the, the commentary that's brought forth by the dealers, and I, I think some of this uh, other concerns can be addressed through this. Um, this bill is good for the environment. This bill is good for consumers. This bill is good for small businesses. Um, you know, this, the access to free market, I think, was stressed, and that, that's something I clearly support. And then this, uh, of course, uh, it protects local jobs. So there's a lot in this bill to be excited about. Uh, it is new. Uh, I think we heard in commerce that uh, while there are bills uh, throughout the country, um, uh, no one has, has adopted uh, this type of legislation yet, so I think it is still in its kind of infancy. Uh, but I, I do uh, kind of pledge to continue to work on this uh, with the bill author and uh, hope to engage others as the, um, 
as this conversation continues. I have received numerous emails from different groups too, so I am taking all that into consideration. And uh, you know, um, I think it was stated uh, earlier too. You know, this is the second R of the of, uh, of the three R's of recycling: reduce, reuse, and recycle. So I mean. In this uh, modern digital age, I think this really kind of gets at the core of uh, what the future of our state economy uh, can look like. So look forward to continuing on with the work. Representative Lucero. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and just a couple questions for the bill author. And the first is, uh, as I'm looking at lines 4.1 through 4.6, it reads, for equipment that contains, I'm sorry, let me, uh, that's the wrong line. The, uh, I'm looking at line 2.1 through 2.3. So digital equipment or equipment means any product that depends for its functioning in whole or in part on digital electronics embedded in or attached to the product. And so that's my understanding. That's pretty much every device. I, not every, but the vast majority of products in our modern day have some kind of a chip that if you pull it out, it's not going to function, which means it would qualify uh, to be dependent in whole or in part on a particular component. So almost every piece of equipment in every industry would be in scope in this bill, as I'm reading this, if I'm correct. So that being the case, why did we, or why did you exclude two industries per subdivision six. Why were the motor vehicle equipment manufacturers and the medical device manufacturers specifically excluded when all other industries then are included? Uh, uh, who's I got two? Representative Fisher, right? Mr. Chair. Couldn't phone a friend. Yep. Apologies. Uh, Mr. Chair, I, uh, the automotive industry is excluded because the Massachusetts bill that we mentioned earlier, which is, I believe, the Massachusetts Right to Repair Initiative, resulted in a mem uh, memorandum of understanding that covers the entire national market. So we didn't want this bill to interfere with that memorandum of understanding since it was a pretty well uh, negotiated and fair agreement between the parties concerned. Um, for medical equipment, there were concerns about people being able to fix their own medical devices, especially ones that have, um, you know, are internal. And so we wanted to avoid the possibility of that happening. I think that with the other equipment mentioned, uh, say farm equipment, there are pretty clear uh, precedent in Minnesota law that say people need to inspect equipment like that before they sell it. And uh, you also have a, a particularly higher obligation to do a good job with things that have dangerous implications. So I think that's well addressed by precedent under Minnesota law. Okay, Representative Lucero. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. So part of my concern, then when we go to lines 4.1 through 4.6, which reads, for equipment that contains an electron, uh, electronic security lock or other security related function, the OEM must make available to the owner and to the independent repair uh, providers, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So there are many technologies or equipment that's out there in the universe of equipment that exists in our day-to-day -day lives that contain a security lock to prevent access. And if these dealers, and I'm thinking everything from stoplights to uh, everything that's outside of, uh, of, of uh, equipment to this, uh, to, to vehicles and medical device, if these are made available to the owners of the equipment, I think that, that there are many unintended consequences is all I'm putting forward. But then when I'm thinking about that same section, 4.1 through 4.6, mobile phones, for example, and uh, 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 Representative Johnson brought it up earlier. So you, uh, uh, a consumer can purchase a brand new piece of equipment. I'll just use a mobile phone, for example, so it's brand new. And it's going to have a warranty to some degree, one year, three year, whatever it is. And uh, you've probably heard the term bricking your phone. Joke. And so when you try to access the phone to make modifications to it uh, that is not authorized, it'll brick the phone. And so when I'm reading this, it sounds like this will make tools available to access parts of a phone. And in the case of it's a brand new phone still covered by warranty, if there are modifications made to it because they have to make the electronic lock uh, available to be able to open it and access it, that changes can be made 
that would potentially have an impact on the function of the equipment that then now would impact the, the warranty feature of it that the vendor would still be responsible then for covering warranty. Uh, so I guess I don't think that if you void the warranty, the vendor is responsible for covering the warranty. But whatever the case, no, Mr. It. Chair, just We're clarity. Then what, what I'm referring to is if security locks are made available, so an owner of equipment can now get into and access parts of equipment that contain electronic modules, make modifications to them. How is the owner? How is the the vendor supposed to know that a change had a negative impact to the device, and that they must now, they're on the hook for satisfying the warranty requirements when the owner of it made changes that the vendor shouldn't be responsible for but can't prove. Okay, well, I don't know. Right, so you, you, so you. That. Even if it's source code, you can see the source code is different. But if you want to answer it, go ahead, take different. Take an answer, take a shot. Thank you, Mr. Chair. My name's Kyle Upton, I'm with CPR, cell phone repair. We have 13 shops in town. Um, right. As far as if you came in with the device today, we do not need your password. We can fix the device with hardware uh, replacements and simply you would enter your password to test it with us in the shop. It's not something we need to get internal. It's just simply access to the tools to be able to remove stuff cosmetically perfectly and uh, reassemble perfectly. We'd like the repairs to be as close to OEM as possible, if not OEM. Okay. All right. Uh, any other questions regarding, oh, Chair Johnson. Uh, uh, Chair Lash. I'm just sitting here listening and it brought up some more issues that, uh, and some serious concerns. Because it involves anything with digital and, and computerized. We have a lot of equipment out there, CNC machines in the machine shop industry. We have electronics everywhere. Now take a CNC shop, but guys, instead of the uh, machining is not functioning. So they, instead of calling the actual company, they called, called Joe, Joe Repairman down the street. He comes in, does something, gets it working because he, the codes were available. Now they start using that machine again and the operator's arm is cut off. Who's liable? Is that uh, Joe Repairman down the street have the insurance for that? Or is it going to be a issue where the lawsuit's going after the company and the machine, although they had nothing to do with it? This bill has a lot of problems. I think it needs to go back from the beginning and start over. Okay. Um, Representative Lucero, you had a follow-up, but... Yeah, thank you, Mr. You know. Chair. And so I, just addressing some of the comments that I've heard from other committee members as well, such as it's pro-jobs, pro-environment, pro-consumer... Uh, and I'll just make my thoughts very clear is that this is not a black or white issue. There's a lot of gray in here. And so I don't think some of these comments we're hearing, it's quite that clear cut. And just one example how it may not be as pro-consumer as it's being put out there. Let's use printers, for example. So when you think of printer manufacturers, sometimes you can buy a printer for super cheap, $49.99, $99.99. The printer manufacturer is not making their money on the printer, but they then make their money on, in the case of inkjet, for example, when an inkjet cartridge costs $59.99. So sometimes what these printer manufacturers have done to recoup some of their R&D, millions of dollars that go into producing these equipment for the benefit of society, they try to make the ink cartridge so that it is, uh, you can't use a third party ink cartridge for it. So that when you try to insert a third party ink cartridge, it'll recognize it's not uh, HPs, for example. And so when I'm reading this language, getting back to my security lock, I think there's unintended consequences since the verbiage I brought up. It's the universe of all electronics that are dependent and whole or in part on this. There is, is a large gray area and unintended consequences that it may not, there's a disincentive now for equipment manufacturers if they can't recover their costs that they, it may not be as pro-consumer because less products would be developed. So I'm just putting that out there for the benefit of members to consider. For it's just not Carol, as clear-cut. So thank you, Mr. Chair. They can Carol. recover their costs if they sell the printer for the accurate price and they sell the ink cartridge for the accurate price of what it costs to produce. I guarantee you it does not cost $60 or 100 bucks to produce one of those ink cartridges. It's the OEMs gaming the system to their benefit so they can bleed you out over a longer period of time. Mm -hmm. This bill 
seeks to level the playing field, I think. I think you're right that it's a little bit more of a gray area than it's being presented. However, I think it's grayer than you're presenting as well, too, because it's gained by the OEMs. Any close? Representative Considine. I'm sorry, Mr. Chair. I hadn't planned to comment, but we've watched this for decades now. And I remember the first time I saw it was the Corvette, where you could no longer change the spark plugs in the Corvette in the 70s because you had to have a special tool that only GM had. And we have put out thousands of small business <laughs> have been put out of business because of specialized things that were done deliberately, like the tool that you needed to change one spark plug. You could get the other seven, but you couldn't get the eighth. Um, and this has been a deliberate uh, march towards consolidating and putting small business people out of business. Um, and thank you, Representative Fisher, for bringing forward this bill. Representative Fisher, closing comments. Thank you. Uh, basically, I want to say right now I can take my car most places to get it fixed. I should be able to do the same with my computer or phone. I ask for your support. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the chair renews his motion that House file. Oh, that's right. I'm sorry. Representative Noor moved the, mo moved the motion that House file 1138 as amended be placed on the general register. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say no. No. Motion prevails. You're on the general register. Thank, Thank you, you, Representative uh, Fisher and testifiers. Uh, members, uh, tonight we're going to be back for House File 1151, Representative Hassan, House File 804, that's mine, that's the Data Practices Commission. I got a House File 2004, unredacted information of the parties, and House File 262, Representative Dean. Tomorrow there will be uh, gestational carrier contracts, child foster care, Second. Thank you. Human services, policy provisions, and uh, children and family services, and industrial hemp. So make sure you're here for this tomorrow so you can hear industrial hemp. Any other business before the committee? Representative O'Neill. Mr. Chair, did you say when and where we're meeting tonight? It's 5 p.m. right here. Yeah. yeah, and by the way, all the other uh, junior uh, chairs soaked up the hearing rooms for Friday. So if we have to meet on Friday, it's going to be at 5 p.m. too. Really excited about that. Okay, there being no other <laughs> business before the committee, committee is, wait, we're in recess. We're in recess.